Hi everyone, this is an introduction to Lab 6 for Springs. We're doing this introduction to make sure everybody is on a level playing field as they prepare to submit their final lab reports. We just want to recover everything in the lab presentation to make sure that we all understand where we are. You may understand or have seen all of this material before, in which case this video isn't for you. But if you are confused about something going through your lab, or you didn't get a chance to collect the data you want, this video is intended to go through the data collection and give you access to sample data that you can use in preparation for your lab report submission. In particular, we are preparing to submit revised lab reports right now. So you can use these data instead of the data in your original lab report in preparation of your final lab report. Please go ahead and make a note if you choose to do so. The first thing that I'd like to cover is the experiment in part one. Uh, here we're going to use Hooke's Law to describe how a spring is extended or compressed given a mass. You'll notice that the way we've written it, this is that the change in force for a spring is determined by some spring constant k times how much that spring is extended. You'll notice the use of these deltas. So in all cases, when we're making measurements, we need to consider this, the force, relative to some force measurement, uh, in which case, in this case, we'll usually choose the smallest mass or smallest force involved in the problem. We'll also want to compare that to the difference in displacements, x minus x naught. So again, we're going to have to pick an f naught and an x naught to carry out this analysis. The way this experiment is going to work is we're going to do two parts. The first is we're going to calibrate our measurements. So what we're going to do is we're going to hang different masses from a spring that's suspended vertically, and then we're going to measure how much the spring stretches. So we're going to basically have a known force and known displacements, and then we're going to use that to find the spring constant. Then we're going to pivot to part two, where we're going to be using an unknown mass, and we're going to take that unknown mass and the known k to find the mass. So we're going to find m, but the trick here is we will know k, the spring constant. So we are going to then basically see how much it stretches, and the known spring constant to figure out what the unknown force or the unknown mass happens to be. Let's look at how we're going to collect data for that. Here's your virtual lab partner, Kyle. Kyle is collecting data for you by suspending a 500 gram mass from a red spring. He makes sure that the spring is still, and he measures the distance from the bar holding the spring down to the top of the mass, and he's going to record that in a spreadsheet that we will now provide for you. Here we're going to have a second weight to this. And again, take the measurement at the same point. Then again, we're going to add one more weight. You will then have a full set of data that looks something like this. Uh, these are the actual data in the spreadsheet where we've tabulated each individual mass suspended and then how much the spring stretches. So what we're going to do is we will need to make a plot here uh, for use in our Linest calculations that is plotting the change in F, the change in the force, versus the change in the distance. And from Hooke's law, the slope of this relationship should be the spring constant. So if you're looking at this, uh, this is the extra force that's being applied. You'll need to know that the force is equal to the mass times the standard gravitational acceleration, noting that the masses are given in grams, you'll need to convert to kilograms. To figure out the change in force, please go ahead and use the first value as your f naught. So in this case, 
it's going to be every force will be measured as F minus F naught. And you're going to go ahead and pick that F naught is going to be equal to uh, 0 0.5 kilograms times the 9.81 meters per second squared. Similarly, you'll need to pick the first displacement here as your x naught, and then your change in x is going to look something like uh, whatever the x value is minus that 45.4 centimeters or 0 0.454 meters. The next thing that you'll want to do is to measure the slope of that line by plotting your delta x values versus your delta f values. And you're going to want to do that by uh, just making a graph in Excel. And one axis should be the delta x values you calculated, so delta x on the x-axis. You'll put delta f on the y-axis. You'll get some points that really you hope are on a straight line. Then you'll go ahead and you'll use Linus to make a regression line through those points. And then the slope of that line will be your spring constant. So slope equals k. The next thing that we'll need to do is to find the unknown mass using the spring constant that we just calculated. For the unknown measurement, we are going to measure from the top again to the top of the known masses and the known hanger, just like this. We're then going to have the unknown mass on the hanger, and again measure to the top of the known mass on this spring. Now you will have a set of data that you'll be able to use to calculate the unknown mass. In the previous part, you should have been able to figure out what the spring constant is, so you should know what k is. We're giving you a known mass, which has a total mass of 598.5 grams, and the displacement that it stretches. And then, using Hooke's law, you ought to be able to figure out what the unknown mass is, because it's the mass minus the original mass times g, that's the change in force, and that's got to be equal to the spring constant times the displacement that you measure for the unknown minus the displacement for the known. So everything in here should be known except for the mysterious unknown mass. Go ahead and calculate that through and make sure that you can compute an error on it. It's also important to note that you shouldn't use the same reference point that you did in part one of the lab. That's because we have a different top of the mass, so we're no longer measuring to the top of the black mass like we did for the known masses, but here we're measuring to the top of a specific experiment. The only thing that's the same here is going to be the spring constant k. In the next part of the lab, we're going to solve for the properties of the system using simple harmonic motion. And in this case, we're going to use the idea that a spring hung from a mass is going to oscillate up and down with an angular frequency of omega, which is equal to the square root of the spring constant, over the mass of the system. So we're going to use that relationship. Omega is equal to root k over m. And we're going to combine it with our definition of omega that says that we can also write omega as 2 pi over the oscillation period for a system. And we're going to use this relationship because the oscillation period is a lot easier to measure than omega. So we're going to solve this into a linearized form by squaring both sides of the relationship. And then we get a relationship for mass that's equal to, uh, it's going to be equal to k times t squared over 4 pi squared. So that's going to give us our uh, relationship here where m is going to be the y variable and t squared over 4 pi squared will be the x variable and then k will be the slope of the spring constant. Uh, the slope of this line will be the spring constant. The final thing we're going to note is that this mass includes the mass we're suspended from it 
plus the mass of the spring, or some effective mass of that. So we're going to replace this with mass of whatever's hung plus the effective mass of the spring. And if we do that, we get a nice linear relationship here where I can write down uh, the mass is my y variable, uh, the x variable is t squared over 4 pi, the slope of the relationship is k, and then the offset is the effective mass of the spring. So this is ultimately what we want to go ahead and measure. We know how to measure the masses by just looking at their values, but how are we going to go ahead and measure the period of the system t? For simple harmonic motion, we are going to start by putting a weight on the spring. The important part for this is to make sure that there is enough weight so the springs are not touching in between the actual coils. That way we have the simple harmonic motion without having any other forces involved. We are going to then time 10 oscillations for this and only pull it enough to get those oscillations, but not too much so that it collides back in on itself. So we only need four centimeters or so of oscillation to get what we want. And I'm going to start the timer here at the top of the oscillation and count 10 oscillations. So I'm going to pull, start it. And I stop at the top of the other oscillation. 8.97 seconds. To estimate the error in our measurements, we're basically just going to have a estimate in our reaction time for where the top of the amplitude was in our harmonic motion. In this case, I'm just going to press the timer button and measure and try and react to get a one second time and take a few measurements and get an idea of what our reaction time is. So I would press the button and at one second, I'd want to press it. Right here, I'm getting about 1.18, 1.17 seconds. So our reaction time is about 0 0.1517 seconds. The average, I think, is around 0 0.2 seconds is what it's usually regarded as. Now we have a set of data where we have a bunch of suspended masses, and then we measure the time that it took for 10 different oscillations here. Each oscillation uh, would take a fraction of that time. So to figure out the period of a single oscillation, we just take the time for those 10 oscillations and divide it by 10. Uh, Kyle just made an argument for why the uncertainty in the time should be about 0.2 seconds. And that's in the total time. So to figure out the uncertainty in the period, we end up with a period of, of an error in the period of 0.02 seconds. So we have this value here. And we can go ahead and then make a plot where we put together the uh, masses on the y-axis. And we put on the value for t squared over 4 pi squared on the x-axis. And then that'll give us a series of data that, again, we really hope will be in a line. We'll go ahead and fit that line using linest, and this will give us an estimate of what k is. So this is going to be k from the oscillations. In part one, you found k from the uh, unknown, uh, from the Hooke's law. And then here, we also have measured the oscillation period for the unknown mass. So using this relationship, uh, we're going to go ahead and calculate the k. The offset here will give you the effective mass. And then we can go back to the expression to figure out the unknown mass by taking the k value you measure here, uh, multiply it by the t squared over 4 pi that we determined in the value. Here's the t squared, or the t for the t squared. And then we're going to uh, correct the mass effective here. Uh, to be clear, I should note that this is the negative mass effective because this is coming in here with a negative sign.